I got nothing. No, I'm joking. I got something to say. Um, we're going to be returning to the book of Hebrews, if, if you'll remember, before, uh, before harvest uh, month came into play and then uh, Advent season and all that goes with the last uh, month and a half or two uh, with the special messages and, and us getting to remember the birth of Christ. Um, we kind of left the book of Hebrews. We were, had just really started uh, chapter 11, which is uh, known in uh, the book of Hebrews as the roll call of faith. Uh, and it just talks about individuals in the Old Testament who, who because of their faith, gained favor with God. He, he called them righteous because they believed Him, and they believed in Him, and they lived out a life for Him. And so, therefore, He rewarded them with salvation. And it is uh, in this chapter, in this book, that we can find encouragement, especially today as it seems so dark in the world... All around us, we see, well, I see, I don't know if you see, I see things occurring that I never thought I would see in my lifetime. I see uh, attacks against the church that I never thought would have happened. I see attacks against the family that I could have never imagined. I see acts of brutality that I, you, you can't unsee. Um, there are so many things happening in the world today that as a people of faith, we need to, to be encouraged in our walk. We need to, to, to see the, the uh, examples of these men of old, these uh, men that have gone before us, and, and recognize that they face some of the same difficulties we do. They, they face some of the same obstacles, the, the same concerns, maybe the same insecurities, maybe the, 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 the same uh, feeling of desperation maybe that uh, sometimes we might feel is uh, maybe maybe you feel a light isolated or alone, and for those that uh, that have just been baptized, uh, you know, it's a reality that when we give our life to Christ, then what happens is our adversary immediately comes in and tries to take that uh, confidence away from you, and they tries to uh, cut your legs out from underneath you, so that. So that even though you may be a new creation in Christ Jesus, if we as a church don't lift these five up in prayer, if we as a church don't encourage them, if we don't, as a church don't come alongside uh, mothers and, and aunts and uncles and fathers and grandparents and, and all of those that are the immediate family and encourage them to strengthen the faith of these, these five, it's, it's very likely that uh, they will fall prey to the attacks of our our adversary. And so we need to be uh, firm in our faith. We need to be firm in our belief of who God is and in and, and our walk. And, and our faith cannot be halfway. We can't ever come before God with, with half a heart. We have to give him all of ourselves. In fact, we, we've looked at two men of old, but in the midst of that, God gave us a beautiful definition of what faith is. It is the evidence of things hoped for and the substance of things not seen. And, and so you see that and you go, okay, I don't fully understand that, but yeah, I do kind of understand that. But then he goes on and he says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so we as his children, we need to be about pleasing God by, by walking in faith with him. It's not about the works we do, but it is about our trust in him and our willingness to go and do what he's called us to do as Christians our willingness to forgive those that may have hurt or harmed us, our willingness to love those that, that may oppose us, our willingness to forgive those that may have taken something from us, our willingness to serve Christ and to tell others about Him, about what He's done in our life, in my life, and how, he take, how He's taken me and, and made me a new creation in Christ Jesus. And so we need to be encouraged today. And today we're going to look at a, a hero of of the faith and one of the men of old. Now we've we've already looked at Abel uh, in this uh, walk through Hebrews, and and he was one of the first men that that we looked at. And if you remember, Abel was one of the first two sons of of Adam and Eve. And Abel and Cain were to bring an offering to the Lord, and and Cain brought just something from his flock, but Abel brought a better sacrifice. He brought of the best of his produce, and 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 God had regard for Abel's sacrifice, but he had no regard or actually disdain for the sacrifice that Abel brought. And instead of, of changing and bringing a better sacrifice, Abel's 
plan or his way of uh, making all of that right, at least in his mind, is to go out and lure his brother into the field and kill him. And, and, and you see that, that Cain approached God with faith and trust, and therefore he is the first name mentioned in the roll call of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. And then another man that we've looked at is Enoch. We don't know a whole lot about Enoch. He's mentioned once or twice through the, through the Old Testament and in the New Testament. But he's in the genealogy from uh, the son that, that God gave Adam and Eve to, to take the place of Abel. Seth was his name. And, and as you go through the book of Genesis, you'll, you'll see there's several different, well, there's two different genealogies that shows the genealogy of Abel and, and as he was pushed out and, and uh, banished. And then you see the, the genealogy of Seth. And, and in that genealogy, you see uh, a man by the name of Enoch. And it says that when Enoch was 65, he fathered Methuselah. If you know anything about the Bible, Methuselah was the oldest man that ever lived. Now, it, it may or may not be this, but at least if you work out the timeline in, in Genesis, then Methuselah died when the flood occurred. So Methuselah uh, most likely was still alive when Noah was walking the earth and building the ark and, and doing all of these things. But Enoch showed that it was possible to walk with God no matter what. Because what had happened with Abel killing, with Cain killing Abel was you saw evil enter into the world. Of course, sin came in through, through Adam's sin, but that began to have an effect on his children. And then you see that the world began to turn wicked and, and there was violence and there was, uh, there was this indifference to uh, God and who he is and who he was. And, and lest we forget this, they may not have had a Lifeway on every corner or they may not have been able to go to Amazon and, and order the latest uh, uh, book by the latest Christian author, but, but they had oral tradition. And, and many, if you, if you work out the timeline and if, and if it is exact, and, and there's some, some ideas whether or not it's, it's notional or that it's an exact timeline, but if you work out the timelines, these guys, I mean, they were living 900 years, 800 years, 1,000 years, and, and they were, they were uh, having a lot of children and producing a lot of offspring. And, and, and they would have had the oral tradition from the horse's mouth itself, from Adam. Adam lived 930 years, so he was on the earth for a good while, uh, while a lot of uh, his sons and grandsons and, and on down the line were, were uh, producing uh, children and populating the earth. And, and they would have had the oral tradition, I can just see it now, they had a family gathering and Adam would have gotten there and he would have said, let me tell you about the time that I was in the Garden of Eden. Man, everything was perfect. And then that woman that God gave me, Eve, no, I'm joking, he would have waited till Eve was out of the room before he said that. And then he would have looked at all the kids and said, don't you tell your grandmother that. But he would have told them, hey, I got to name all the animals. A horse ran by and one of his kids said, oh, a horsey. He said, I named that. Bird flies over, said, I named that. Caught a fish, I named that. Here's a cow coming around, I named that. That was Bessie. And, and, you know, they would have had an oral tradition because Adam used to walk with God in the cool of the garden. He was face to face with him before sin entered in and ruined the relationship. And, and so they would have had an oral tradition of who God is. They would have understood. They may not have had a Bible to go and flip through the pages or a preacher to preach to them, but rest assured they knew who God was. And you'll see that they've chosen to go down a wicked path rather than a good one. And so Enoch shows us that it's possible to walk with God no matter what. He was 65 when he fathers Methuselah. He lives another 300 years, and then it says he was no more, that God just took him up. Man, if that would happen today, that'd be fantastic. Maybe not for Sarah, but for me, that'd be great. Be up here preaching, and all of a sudden, God just says, hey, Jim, let's go. See you. I'm not sticking around. But the Bible tells us he walked with God. He's one of these pre-flood uh, men that, that lived and walked with God. And there was only two pre-flood that God said walked with him. That was Enoch, and it was Noah. And Noah overcomes incredible obstacles. And maybe he learned how to obey God. Maybe he knew 
that he needed to obey God. He at least had a relationship with God because it says that God told him what he was going to do, gave his plans to him, and he said that, that Noah was a righteous man. And so here he is, in spite of his circumstances, in spite of the difficulties around him, in spite of the opposition to him, he carried out the commands of God, he remained faithful, and he did it all by faith. And I hope that as we go through this, this account of Noah, um, that you will understand just a little bit that no matter what's going on in the world today, whatever is, is against you, whatever atrocities you see uh, being committed, whatever uh, difficulties you might face, all of these things, God is aware of them. And, and if He calls you by name, if he, if he has written your name in the Lamb's Book of Life, and He calls you His child and an heir and joint heir with Christ, and He says that you've been sealed against the uh, day of redemption, rest assured he is watching over you. And rest assured, He is encouraging you and equipping you if you will come to Him and ask. And rest assured that He will never leave you nor forsake you to your own devices. And He is there. He wants you to succeed. But you have to put yourself second and put Him first and walk with Him by faith. No matter what He asks you to do, no matter where He asks you to go, whatever the circumstance He puts you in, you have to walk by faith. And Noah is a great example of someone who is under great pressure from the world around him, and yet he still remained faithful and carried out the commands that God had given him. Let's stand in honor of reading God's Word. We're going to read one verse. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. The words are on the screen. And you'll see this a lot in Hebrews. It says, by faith. It's not by works. He says, by faith. By faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, that's an important phrase, about things not yet seen, in reverence, prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. You may be seated. Now, I want you to understand, we're going to go back to Genesis a lot and look at the the story of Noah is such that we have it in the account of Genesis. So if you want to put your finger in Genesis chapter 6, we will go to a couple other places in the Bible, but primarily we're going to be in Genesis chapter 6 and then maybe and then back and forth to Hebrews. But Noah, Noah's faith was expressed in a wicked generation. You see that as, as God is talking with Noah in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. It says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. The world was rampant with iniquity. It was rampant. Every thought of man other than Noah and Enoch was gone by this time. And, and I, I can only imagine that that includes Methuselah and any of the others that came directly down the line of Seth. All of their thoughts was continually on evil. It was continually thinking, what can I do to, to, to get what I want? And what can I do to, to, to put you last and to, to cut your legs out from under you? And, and I don't even care how I do it. I don't care if, you, if you're comfortable. I don't care if you're happy. I, don't care. I just want me to, to be satisfied. Every thought was wicked. It was iniquity rampant. You see that today. I mean, in the attack of January 6th in the, in the nation of Israel, the things that people were doing as they crossed the border and began to kill innocent children and, and women. And, and, and we can discuss the merits of the war. And I, I, I mean, that's not what I'm up here for. But that was wicked. That was evil. And, and so there's this iniquity that's rampant around Noah. And, and not only that, the world was rife with riotous violence. You like that alliteration? Rife with riotous violence? Baptist preachers love alliteration. There was violence everywhere. I mean, not only were they thinking evil thoughts, but they were committing acts of violence against those around them. One of the descendants of Abel, a, a man by the name of Tubal-Cain, said, 
I mean, one of the things Abel did when he, when he left, he said, this, this, this uh, punishment is too great for me, Lord, as he's banished and pushed away. And he says, people, when they meet me, now, Adam and Eve had been having other children, and he says, when people meet me, they're going to kill me. And, and he says, listen, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure that you're not killed. And, and, and if anybody hurts or harms you, then retribution will be taken. And so one of the descendants of, of Abel... Uh, who was already in a wicked line, he said, listen, you, God was going to avenge Abel seven times. He's going to avenge me even more. And this was a guy, he said, I, I killed somebody just for making me angry. I mean, these were the evil thoughts and the violence that was being perpetrated in the world that day. And, and here's Noah right in the midst of it. Genesis chapter 6, verses 11 through 13. Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked on the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had been, con- been corrupted. Their, uh, all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. Then God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. And behold, I am about to destroy them along with the earth. And so here is God talking to Noah, and he says, Listen, they're, they're committing acts that, that, I, that are just beyond... He said, they're corrupt. I'm, I'm going to get rid of them. I'm going to start all over. I'm going to, I'm going to wipe them out. And, and, and you look at the world today and you see the, the lack of compassion, the lack of humanity that people can commit against others, the, the, the things that they can do. I mean, even in our own uh, streets, in our own schools, you see uh, people attacking other people and just with no cause or no reason, just, just because. Just because they can do it. And it was also a world of religious indifference. Not only was it a rampant iniquity, not only was there riotous violence, but there was religious indifference. Listen to what Matthew, uh, what Jesus says in the book of Matthew, chapter 24. He says, For the coming of man will be just like the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. Jesus is saying in, when the end times come and the final judgment arrives, there are going to be people that are going to be surprised. What? We didn't know this was going to happen. He says, just as in the time of Noah, they were eating, they were drinking, they were giving no heed to who God was. They had heard the oral traditions. They knew that God had created the world. They knew what, it was, uh, what things were about. They understood that. And, he, and Jesus says, listen, they were eating, drinking. They weren't giving God any mind. And, and, and they didn't know until the first raindrop fell that their doom was upon them. And there's a warning there for us. I mean, if we're, we're, we're children of faith and we are walking in faith, we don't fear God or His wrath. But for those that, that have this religious indifference or, or think, oh, I, can, I can give my life to Jesus whenever, or I can, I can walk and do the, the things that God calls me to do whenever I want to, or I can have a deathbed confession, you better be careful. Because we don't know when Christ is going to come back. We don't know when that final judgment is going to occur. But he was in a world of religious indifference. Now we see that Noah's faith was established on grace. It was not about the works of building the ark that made him righteous. It was about his faith. And so God poured his unmerited favor out upon him and, and, and said that he was one of these in the roll call of faith, that Noah was saved. When we get to heaven, he's going to be there. And so you see that his faith was established on grace. In 2 Timothy 1, 8 and 9, it says, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. That's an important phrase there too. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace which was granted in Christ Jesus from all eternity. It's almost like Paul is paraphrasing in this letter to Timothy, his letter to the Ephesians, we're saved by grace through faith, not by works, lest any man should boast. But in, in the, in the um, obedience that, that Noah showed, what you, what you had to understand is Noah faced enormous ridicule 
for what God had called him to do. God had, had told him, you're going to build an ark. And we're going to get to a little more specifics later. But he said, you're going to build an ark. And so all of the inhabitants of the world that were probably all uh, centered in, in one pretty geographic location at that time, they're, they're there and they're going, what are you doing, Noah? He goes, well, God has told me that he's going to bring judgment on the earth. And so he's told me to build this ark. And so I'm going to build this ark. Imagine the ridicule that he received when he goes, yeah, God's going to bring a, a, a rainstorm. He's going to flood the earth and, and all of you guys are going to die. One, you're condemning the people that you're talking to, and, and people generally don't like it when you tell them that they're living in sin. And, and two, they're going, we don't even know what a flood is, we don't even know what rain is, and you're telling us God is going to bring judgment on us. You're crazy, Noah. And that was probably on the kind side. I'm sure he said a few other, there were a few other things said to him. So, so Noah faced ridicule. Noah because of his faith and because his faith was established on grace, kept to the task. He trusted God, he kept to that task, and therefore God poured out his grace upon him. But this task, he was told when he was 500 years old that he was to build an ark. And the rains came when he was 600 years old. Now, I, it's been a long time since I was in elementary school, but that seems like there's 100 years between the time he tells Noah to start building an ark and, and that by the time he finishes that ark. A hundred years is a long time to face ridicule and every day to get up and say, hey, honey, I'm going to work. And, you're, and Noah's wife goes, well, what are you going to do today? Well, I'm going to work on the ark. Every day for a hundred years, for a hundred years, faithfully committed to carrying out the commands of the Lord. And in this time, you have to know that Noah trusted God. Because Noah didn't know what rain was. Noah didn't understand what a flood was. There was no need for boats. And, and so here he is being told by God, I see the iniquity of the earth. I'm going to destroy it. I want you to build a boat. I'm going to bring a flood. And you're going to be the only ones that are going to be saved, you and your family. It takes a lot of trust, don't you think? If we could build a machine that could take us back to the past and go back and meet somebody from, let's say, 1,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, say, build a relationship with them, they, 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 they end up trusting you. you, you get in your time machine, you come back here uh, to 2024, and you say, hey, you see that airplane over there? I want you to get up there in that airplane, they're going to fly you up in the air, <laughs> It takes a lot of faith for that person to trust that that airplane's going to get up if they've never seen an airplane or, or to get into a car if they've never seen a car. And, and I'm just trying to contextualize it a little bit for you. They'd never seen rain on the earth. And Noah goes, what? <laughs> you want me to do what? Okay, let me go build this ark. And so his faith was established on grace. He didn't build the ark and say, God, look what I did. He trusted God. And God poured out his grace upon him and did what God told him to do. You know, somebody once told me that God only has children. He doesn't have grandchildren. You know why? Because grandchildren can't get to heaven on the basis of their parents. Only a child of God is going to get to heaven. It's not going to be your work affiliation. It's not going to be your church affiliation. It's not even going to be that you know somebody or somebody knows you. It's only if you know Christ and have given your life to Him and your faith is built or established on the grace of God. We also see that Noah's faith was effective in his family. In Genesis 9, verses 18 and 19, we, we see that once the ark is landed and the, and the earth is, the waters have receded and the, and the ground is dried and, and the ark is opened, that Shem, Ham, and Japheth are the three sons of Noah that he, taught, he brought onto the ark along with the wives. And from these three, the, the whole of the earth is populated. They're given a command to populate the earth. But we know that it was effective in his family because he was 500 when these, when these three were born or these three were with him. And, and so here's Noah's faith 
being strong and effective. Every day he gets up. What are you going to go do today, honey? I'm going to go out and I'm going to work on the ark. Why? Because God told me to. He says he's going to bring judgment on the earth and would you send the boys with me? And so they all worked on this, this ark. They all sat there together and labored together. And rest assured, they may have seen their dad working on the ark, but they also heard all of the ridicule, all of the, the insults, all of the things that were hurled at Noah because people just didn't understand and didn't care about God. And, and they were just ridiculing him for, for trusting God and doing what God has called him to do. And so Noah's faith was strong and it was effective. He shared with his family daily. They were right there with him each and every day seeing him live out his faith in real time. Not, I trust in God and then never do anything for God, or I trust in Jesus and never go to church or never tell anybody about Christ or, or never live out your faith uh, in the world that's around you. But, but they saw it each and every day, him living out his faith, doing the things that were hard, doing the things that were difficult, doing the things that were unpopular, doing the things that the world was opposing him on. And so he shared with his family daily. And his family listened and they were obedient. I mean, there's no mention of, of them hitting the teens and going, Dad, I don't want to go work on the ark today. Dad, I don't want to do that today. I, you know, I, I want to go out with my friends. And so we know that his faith was effective as he shared it with his family. Parents, let me, let me, let me just speak to you for a second. And those of you that, that may want to have children, and I guess, I guess it, it's just any of us. If your faith is real, if there's evidence of a changed life in you, if you desire to follow Christ and to live according to His precepts and His teachings, if you, if you will do the things that He's asked you to do, even if you don't want to do them, seldom do we want to forgive someone who's hurt us and yet we're commanded to forgive. Seldom do we want to leave the comfort of our homes, but He commands us to go. Seldom do we want to give up our own time because after all, that's me time when he says, I want you to spend time with me. But if our faith is real, it will have an impact on your children. If your faith is real and they see you living out that faith day in and day out, maybe not perfectly, but they see you wanting to live for Christ, I would tell you that it is, it is probably almost absolute that your faith will be passed down to your children because part of living out your faith is witnessing to them about your faith. Telling them that you're following God and, and, and keeping to His commandments. You're teaching them in, their, in your home. Your home is filled with, with uh, obedience to God and, and, and a love for Christ and, and a, a willingness to do what He's called us to do. And, and even if you have to explain to your children that they may have to give up something because God has called you to go and do something else. I mean, you may have to give up a really good job that pays you really well and go into the ministry and get a job that doesn't pay you very much. And you have to tell your children, we're not going to have the money for this or the money for that or the money for all the things that we were doing before. But it's, it's okay because this is what God wants us to do. I mean, that was my story when God called me into the ministry. I could have gone back into a much more lucrative career and I had to tell my kids, you're going to have to go without. And yet, some of the best times were when we had the least. There were hard times and they were difficult. But I'd like to think that if you ask my children, they would say that they saw me living out my faith. Maybe not perfectly. Maybe not every day. But I desired to live out my faith. Noah trusted God. His faith was effective in his family. His family listened and were obedient. And as he's living out his faith in front of his family, it's guaranteed that his faith was evident to his neighbors, to those that were coming to ridicule him, those that were coming to oppose him, those that were coming to hurt or harm him, those that were coming to, to trip up the activities that he was undertaking. That you know, Who knows, maybe people came in in the middle of the night and stole tools that he needed to to shape the ark. Maybe they came and stole lumber because they didn't want to go cut it themselves. He had already shaped it and cut it. And so he'd come out and what he thought he was going to be able to work with that day was gone the next day. 
and, and all of these things, but they saw his faith was evident or else they wouldn't have been ridiculing him. His, his work showed what he believed. In Genesis 6-9 it says, these are the records of the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. And you see in the last part of our text today in Hebrews eleven seven, 7, and he became an heir of righteousness, which was according to faith. He worked by faith. He trusted God. Noah walked by faith. In, in, in Genesis 6, 9, it just said there, I mean, I just read it. He was a righteous man and he walked with God. He spent time with him. And how else could God give him the, the direction to, to build an ark? You know, and I've said it before, but it was remarkable. He had to have had a relationship with God before God told him he was going to bring rain because it seems like he didn't bat an eye. Okay, let me get started on the ark. Noah's faith was enlightened by God. This is where we get into human nature, okay? In Genesis 6, 11, and 12, he says, Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked on the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. See, God is reviewing the earth. And so Noah's faith is enlightened by God. God lets Noah in on his plans. Now, we, we're let in on his plans. We have this book, if we'll open it up and read it. But, but you know, how many times have you been walking through life and you go, God, are you there? God, are you seeing what these people are doing to me? Are, are you seeing the, the circumstances that I'm in? God, do you, do you understand what I'm going through? Which is oh, a laughable question to me. God, God do you understand the, the, the pain I'm, I'm feeling? Do you understand the loss I've suffered? Do you, do you understand? And, and, and what God says here as he's talking to Noah, he says, listen, I'm reviewing the earth. I see what's happening on the earth. And maybe Noah up to this point was going, God, I'm walking with you. I'm talking with you. Do you see what's happening around me? And God in this instance says, yes, I do see. I see the wickedness on the earth. I see what is going on. And, and, and I'll tell you, whatever's happening to you, whatever uh, difficulty you're facing, God sees that. And if you find yourself asking, God, do you, do you recognize what's happening to me? The answer to that is yes. God, do you see the difficulty I'm having? Yes. God, do you know the pain that I feel? Yes. God, do you see what that person is doing to me? Yes. The answer is always yes. He always is watching you. He always sees this. And then the second part of human nature that comes in is God is seen revealing his wrath to Noah. I mean, I'm sure that, that if somebody is, is giving you a hard time, you go, God, would you just please bring down a little bit of fire and brimstone on their head? Just, just one lightning bolt. I'll step over here. Just, just one lightning bolt right now. Just, just rid me of their, their, their difficulty. Rid, you know, take them out. I, I mean, if you've never thought that, you are a liar. In the moment that somebody is giving you a hard time, if you've never thought, God, would you just bring your vengeance upon them? I'm ashamed to say, when somebody speeds past me and cuts me off in traffic, I go, God, please let there be a police officer down the road. And please let them see him. But anyway, God reveals his wrath. In, in 6.13, he says, Then God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. And behold, I'm about to destroy them along with the earth. He lets Noah in on his plans. You're going to build an ark for me, and I'm going to destroy them. And yes, I see how wicked they are. Yes, I see what they're doing to you. I see how they're taking my name in vain. I see how they show no, no uh, deference to me. They, they, they don't worship me. I see all of these things, Noah. 
and I'm about to take care of it. And I want you to understand this also. This is 6.13. It's a few verses later that he gives him the plans for the ark. What this means is that Noah was 500 years old when God said, yes, I will exact my, my wrath. Yes, I will destroy the wicked that's around you. He had to wait a hundred years for that. He had to wait a hundred years. With our instant mentality today, we have trouble waiting five seconds. We want instant gratification. Hence my, Lord, would you just bring a lightning bolt out on him? Okay, Lord, I'll be patient. Bring it down in ten days. Just let me be there to watch it. God has revealed his wrath and he has let Noah know that he sees what is happening on the earth. And it's no different today. God sees what is going on in the world today. He sees those who are persecuting his children. And when Jesus came the first time, he came with salvation. He came to bring salvation to a lost and dying world he came to bring light into the darkness but he has promised that he is coming again and when he comes again it will be with judgment and at that point it will be too late for those that have rejected him and so noah's faith was exact in its obedience this is this is really important i think noah simply takes god at his word the proportions of the ark were exact god gave him the exact proportions of what he was supposed to do and if you go to to hebrew or hebrews genesis chapter 6 and you look at verse 15 make the boat 450 feet long 75 feet wide and 45 feet high leave an 18 inch opening below the roof all the way down the boat put the door on the side build three decks inside the boat lower middle and upper and and there have been those that have that have tried to recreate this or at least the the proportions on a scale And they've built what they would uh, imagine the ark would look like. And you know that it's uncapsizable. It it doesn't matter how how hard or how big or how uh, rough the waves or the sea would occur. The boat was not going to turn over. It was not going to sink. It was not going to capsize. God knew exactly what he was doing. But here, (laughs) but here. If Moses didn't, or Moses, if Noah didn't follow the plan and and made it to his own specifications, that may not have been the case. So the proportions of the ark were exact. The promise of judgment was exact. Behold, I am bringing a flood of water upon the earth. Doesn't matter that Noah didn't know what a flood was. I'm bringing a flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life. From under heaven, everything that is on the earth shall perish. Very exact in what his judgment is going to be. And his plan of salvation was also very exact. In verse 18, he says, But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. And then Genesis 7-1, Then the Lord said to Noah, Enter the ark, you and all your household, for you alone I have seen to be righteous before me in this time. And so I already mentioned it before, the performance of Noah was exact. He had to follow God's instructions. Do what God told him to do. Do it in the manner that God told him to do it. The way we carry out the instructions of God does matter. It's not just up to us. God doesn't give us an end point. He gives us point A, point B, point C, all the way to the finish line. We just have to trust him and be a little patient because sometimes he only gives us point A and then he gives us point A, point five. And then, oh, here's point B. When we, when we are obedient to what he's called us to do, we may not see the road ahead of us, but we know what is before us. And if we'll just carry that out and, and live that by faith, Genesis 6.22 said, Thus Noah did according to all that God had commanded him, so he did. So all of that to say this. I mean, I told you at the beginning, I want you to be encouraged. 
Because we look at the world today and we think, my goodness, I have never seen it as bad as it is today. I've never seen some of the atrocities that I've seen today. I've never seen so much vitriol and, and, and venom, or venom or vehemence against the Christian faith. I've never seen people express themselves in such a way. And, and maybe we just lived in a, in a time that was, that was not as bad as it was a long time ago. Um, we don't see people being burned at the stake for their faith, at least not yet. But my question to you is, are you living out your faith? Or have you allowed the pressures or the difficulties of the world to, to discourage you or to think, God, where are you? Do you see what's happening to me? Do you see what these people are doing to me? God, why is it you're taking vengeance on them? How come you haven't stopped them? And too often Christians will falter and stumble in their, in their walk of faith because they think, God, you've forgotten me. Noah was saved by his faith by his trust in God, even though he did not know what a flood was, he did not know what rain was. But his faith, his trust in God led to salvation. There came a day when the rain began. Now, the account in Genesis says that God put Noah and his family into the ark. All the, all the animals and their kinds had entered the ark and God sealed up the door behind him and he put the pitch around the door so that it would be watertight. And I can only imagine when the last application of pitch was put on the door that the first sound of thunder and the first drop of rain fell. And all of those that had ridiculed Noah, all of those that, that had uh, tried to hurt or harm him, all of those that had committed violence are now standing in a deluge of rain. And, and they're standing there, and here's this ark. And Noah, now he's in the ark. And he's hearing all of this, but he, he can't really see it except for that 18 inches of, of, of a view space. And the water gets up to their knees. And they're sitting there thinking, this might be bad. Water gets up to their chest. I think we're in trouble. Water gets up to above them. And they might have treaded water for a while. But they knew in that moment that Noah had been speaking the truth to them. They knew in that moment that Noah's faith was real and their life was over. But God came to those people. Noah's witness to them, if they would have just turned, but they wouldn't. The same story repeats itself with Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham, hey, if you can just find 50 people that are righteous, you, maybe you won't destroy it. God, if you can just find 40 people, if you can just find 30 people, and not one was found in Sodom and Gomorrah to be righteous, and so God destroyed it. God gives us an opportunity to repent. In Matthew 24, and we've read it a little bit of this before, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up until the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them away. And this is how it's going to be with the coming of the Son of Man. They're going to know nothing until His judgment descends. In this dark world, wherever there is faith, there is light. If you're a child of the King, you carry that light. We're still human. We still get discouraged. Don't. We're still human. We don't like to be opposed. We don't like to be put down. We don't like to be ridiculed. Just put your hope and your trust in Christ. It's still no fun going through some of those things. But God has given you a task. He says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will never leave you to your own devices if you will but trust me. This faith, this real faith, this true faith that is evidenced by a changed life, it results in salvation. The false faith that is, is grounded in I grew up in church so I must be saved or the false faith that says oh, I, made a, I prayed a prayer and I 
I, I went into the baptismal waters, but, but you've never lived for Christ. You've never put yourself second and put him first. You've never allowed him to be the Lord of your life or to, to be the, the, the one that can lead your life. We hold on to pettiness. We hold on to anger. We hold on to unforgiveness. We, all of these things, we need to put that aside. We need to trust him. It's only in that real faith do we find salvation. The truth has always been and it always will be the righteous will live by faith. The righteous will live by faith. And if you're living by faith, then God will, people will see the righteousness of God in you. And so, how about you? How about me? How about us? Are we walking by faith? Are we trusting Him with everything we are? Are we living out our faith daily? Fathers, we uh, come to this time of invitation as we close this message. Lord, I was one of those that I knew you, I trusted you, but I wasn't always walking with you. But Lord, you never let me go. You never, you never quit holding on to me. And Lord, I know that there's, in any church this size, there's, there's people that are in that boat. Maybe they're discouraged. Maybe they're uh, despondent. Maybe they are disillusioned. Uh, maybe they've allowed um, the pressures of the world to overwhelm them. I pray, Lord, that in this moment, in this place, that you would give them peace, that you would let them know without a shadow of a doubt that you're there, that, that they would feel your presence and they would feel the release of that, that difficulty, that, that burden that they carry, and, and they, would, they would once again feel the joy of that salvation and that joy of, of being close with you again. Father, I pray that if there are people here that don't know you, but you're, you're, you're tugging at their heart, and they know that they need something different. They need a relationship, that they're hopeless and helpless and they feel lost. Father, I pray that you would be at work in their hearts, that in the time of invitation as we, as we come to that point, that they would respond to you, to your prompting, to your, to your calling of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, for those of us that are walking with you, those of us that are living for you, I pray that you would strengthen us and encourage us and help us, Lord, to, to continue to do the work that you've placed before us. Father, I pray that we would be a faithful church, a faithful people, a faithful person living out the commands that you've given us. And that, Lord, we would forgive those that have harmed us, that we would love those that, that are before us, that we would serve those in need, that we would encourage those around us, that we would strengthen the fellowship of the body of believers in this place. And that, Lord, we would be obedient and be witnesses in the world around us. Father, help us to walk by faith regardless of the world around us. Help us to keep our eyes fixed upon you and our hearts focused on you. Lord, and use us for your glory and for your honor. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So.